Over 10,000 signatures in just two months. Well, two things. One was that as Burundi and Antarctica, who knew that there were so many lesbians in Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, and I just can't believe, you know, it left me speechless how brave some people were. Yeah, there were several signatures from Iran wow. and from um, Ukraine. And none of those people signed anonymously, and yet the auction was there to do so. They did not take it. I mean, the bravery was just, it literally left me in tears frequently, because I checked this on a daily basis. And yet there were academics in Britain and America who felt that they had to sign anonymously because it might affect their career if they didn't. It just shows how far we've got to go. And then the other thing that amazed me and frequently had me in tears were the comments. This is just taken at random. But you know, some of them, like Anonymous of Peru, who wrote in very broken English that it gives them hope that one day LGBT people in their country would be honoured in this way. And the inference was clear that if Britain doesn't do this, who the hell will? So next one. So, where I designed the first sculpture to go was next to those library steps, which at that point, as you can see, aren't doing very much. You know, it's just a bit of grass and a bit of scrubby something or other. And I wanted a sculpture where she would be striding up a rock and then you could get level with her on those stairs. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, they're still saying no. And every few months I give it another go and they're still saying no. Okay, so next one. So, Along the way, I got talking with people in York, and it turns out that King's Manor, which is a grade one listed medieval building, it's where the English uh, Parliament used to sit before it moved to Westminster, um, is the site of her old school. And if there's one thing that made Amnesty the person she was, it was her early education. And I really wanted to flag that up, and we know also that she was kicked out of school for being um, a distraction or a disturbance to the other people. <laughs> um, and what's really interesting is um, the head of archaeology took us around King's Manor and showed us a whole window full of schoolgirl graffiti. And that was on one side, but then on the L-shaped bit, um, in a window just above head height, right smack bang in the middle of the classroom, was this. And anyone who's looked at Anne Lister's handwriting will know that she has a very, very distinctive way of doing D's and other letters that have a tail, whereas most people do the tail first and then the curly bit. She does the curly bit first and then the tail is almost a spiral. So pay attention to the D at the end of diamond. And for those that can't read that, it says, with this diamond, I cut this glass. With this face, I kissed a lass. <laughs> so it's a very Lister-esque turn of phrase, and this is in the middle of a classroom of a girls' school. Wow. So it couldn't be interpreted in any other way. And knowing now the kind of prose style of Anne Lister, um, and also knowing her handwriting, because I've been studying it, you know, in order to get it right on my sculptures to get it similar. Um, yeah, I think it's my Anne Lister. So I have asked the University of York to get a handwriting specialist in to confirm this, because I really do think it is. So the long and the short of it is, is that um, it seems like York is more organised than Halifax is. Uh, there's an LGBT group, that forum, that are right behind this as a project. There's also an LGBT History Month group as well. The Civic Trust are really in favour of this. The university on the whole is in favour of this. The only people I don't know about is the Arts Committee, and that's the next bit. Um, and the, uh, what's it, the Culture, uh, Communities, and the uh, Equalities Department of the City Council are all in favour of this. So where I want this sculpture to go is immediately underneath this writing. We have the next one. <coughs> That's an example of the schoolgirl graffiti around the other side. And some of it is dated, and some of it's 50, 60 years after Anne Lister's left school. So she's still leading girls astray. Um, lots and lots of uh, graffiti about a Miss Green, whoever she was, everyone seemed to love her. 
um, and there was one that was cut short. So she was caught in the act and never managed to finish her missing. Next one. And this is the site I wanted to go. Now, it doesn't look that exciting, but it's actually in an inner courtyard which is protected from the outside world. To get in there, you have to walk through the building. So there's no way she could get graffiti or vandalised in there. Not that it's easy to vandalise bronze anyway. Um, and also, those two sets of windows are actually the public loos. So she's not going to be blocking anybody's view. No one's going to be complaining that there's too much noise in there, you know, outside their office that they can't concentrate. So that's the spot I want to go on to. Um, next one, please. And that's the view from the other way. So that door on the left there, that's the door to her school. And the windows above are uh, where she did her graffiti. Uh, and that space on the left of the path, or quite near the door even, potentially. I mean, there's several spots within that courtyard she could go. But that's where I'd like her to go. Next one. And then if the courtyard is out of the question, I mean, uh, back in February, it was looking very possible. Now I'm being told that there are plans for the courtyard, but no one's telling me what. So the other possible is actually between these two trees in the front garden, which overlooks the museum square. So it's right smack bang in the middle of York. And you can't really miss it. Um, the only problem with that, of course, is that um, probably a path will have to be put in uh, to protect the lawn. And uh, there may be some archaeology under there, but it's likely there'll be less archaeology under there than uh, under the courtyard, which will make life a lot easier. Next one. Okay, so, on to research. So, the next problem, uh, apart from, you know, planning permission, archaeological surveys, all that stuff, is to work out what Annalista looked like, really looked like, not like Gentleman Jack, but actually looked like. What did she wear? Now, thankfully, in those five million words, there's a lot about clothing. Um, and just like lesbians now, um, she's constantly trying to find something that she can wear that is socially acceptable but still reflects who and what she is. Um, and just reading all of that, especially, um, you can see there's a lot of tabs in I Know My Own Heart, and that's been reprinted as The Secret Diaries of Miss Ann Lister, which I've got some for sale and 50% of the sales of those will go towards this project. So you'll really be helping a lot if you, uh, if you buy one of those. But as you can see, um, Helena Whitbread, because she acted as an editor, the secret diaries of Miss Hanlister, or in my case, I know my own heart, because that's an earlier version, is almost exclusively in Hanlister's own words. So you get the, you get the, the full thing there. And as you can see from all the tabs, there's an awful lot about clothing Mostly about mending her stays. It's constantly mending her stays. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been chopping my way through that lot. I'm still trying to get through some of them. Um, but on the whole, Helena McBread's the best one because she starts at the beginning. <laughs> That's always useful. So, if you really want to know what Anne Lister was like, a good place to start is The Secret Diaries because that takes you way back before. Uh, gentleman Jack. Next one. So this is the portrait most people are familiar with. But there are a few issues with this one. Um, firstly, <laughs> where do you start with this? Um, it was painted posthumously. So she was long dead when this came along. And uh, it was commissioned by Anne Walker. And there are a few exaggerations in this. So she's got a much bigger bust than she generally had. Um, she's often stuffing her stays to give herself a better bosom. Um, it's quite a soft image, quite unlike Gentleman Jack, you, I think you'll agree. Uh, if you go on to the next one, this is one that was done in her lifetime, and it's truly atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this one that the previous one, which is done posthumously, was based on. So this was done by a miniaturist in Halifax. And what's really interesting is that when she had it done, and it was done over two days, she brought it home and showed it to her friends. And all of her friends said it looked nothing like her at all. 
And she herself and her aunt and uncle thought it caught her manner precisely. So it's very interesting. And then there are a number of issues with this. Apart from being small and a bit knackered, um, it's had to, it has had some very good repairs done since. Um, but you'll see from the arm of that chair that the painter had no understanding of perspective. So if you look at that point there, they're both seen full on. And then if you look at her eye that's to our left, that's painted as if full on. And then her mouth is painted as if full on and not a three quarter front view, which it is. Her cheek is okay, her nose is okay, her chin is painted full on again. And then they haven't left much room for a cranium either, a bit like the pre Raphaelites later on. Um, so, oh, oh, she's also got a very extended neck, to the point of possibly being dislocated. <laughs> and very, very, very sloping shoulders. Um, so all in all, it's a bit weird, and the more you look at it, the more it disturbs the mind. Uh, on to the next one. So when you get a close-up, you, you start to see just how weird this is. <laughs> and of course, to make the sculpture, I'm, I'm trying very hard to be as true to who and what she was and looked like, you know, as I possibly can. And these are the only two sources of information I have to go on. Uh, so that, by blowing that up, you can see that is full on, that eye. And that mouth is twisted down and full on. Uh, the chin is full on. Her brows are full on. Her nose and her cheek are three quarter front views, as they should be. So yeah, the more you look at it, the more it starts to warp your head. Okay, next one. Then the only other source of information I got, because Anne Lister died just at the point as photography was getting going in this country. And two years, you know, after she, well, she died two years later, and, but all of that time she was in Europe and the further reaches of, you know, Russia and, and similar. So um, this is a late Victorian photograph of her sister. Next one. But it's... Granted, when you blow it up, it's again, it starts to pickle the head a bit. Um, but it does show some essential, useful things. So the eyes are really deep set in the corner, in there. And the nose, her nose is long and straight, and just has, as she was in the painting. So that's really useful. She's a little bit jowly, but she's older than Anne Lister was when she died. So, you know, it does give me a little bit more information. It also shows the really high forehead as well that both of the paintings gave, but a lot more cranium. <laughs> Next one. And that's comparing the two together. And it, when you start to look from one to the other, you can start to see the differences. And the posthumous one, on the whole, apart from that eye's a little bit old, um, but on the whole, is painted as a three-quarter front view by somebody who knew about perspective. Um, and you can you know, you can cross from one to the other. So that is what I'm working from. That and that hugely uh, expanded view of a tiny photograph of Anne Lister's sister. Next one. So, to Gentleman Jack. <laughs> so, as you can see, um, you've got hair in rigid curls, uh, horizontal bands, which she didn't actually have and a top hat that is never ever mentioned at any point <laughs> ever in any of her diaries. Okay, next one. And I hate to break it to you. <laughs> Three weeks ago, I was under the illusion she never, ever, 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 ever wore a bonnet. And then I was reading in Female Fortune by um, Jill Lincoln that two years